Journey Through the Radiant Citadel was released this past week. We're going to give a little spotlight and see what we get. Wonders of the Multiverse, a new playtest from Wizards of the Coast came out, which leads me to a little bit of a rant about adding actions to the decision stack in D&D. Their second chapter of the Spelljammer Academy was released on D&D Beyond for free to everybody, the second of a set of Spelljammer adventures. Teo Sabadia has a new series of articles on Roll20 where he's talking about Spelljammer. Ben Riggs, the author of Slaying the Dragon, A Secret History of Dungeons and Dragons, has released some interesting statistics that I think are a good way to look at where we are with D&D today. And finally, we have the July 2022 Patreon questions that we cover at the end of each of our shows today. All of this and more today on the Lazy D&D Talk Show. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things D&D. This work, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. The patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive material, exclusive video previews, products like the City of Arches and Sly Flourish's Uncovered Secrets, access to a dedicated Discord channel, and all kinds of other stuff. But most of all, they help me put on shows like this. To the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you so much for your support. This week, Journey Through the Radiant Citadel came out, and I like it a lot. I think it's a really outstanding book of adventures. So we are going to take a look at it. For full disclosure, the D&D Beyond version of this, I do get for free because I wrote for D&D Beyond a while back. I was not given a review copy. I did, however, go to my local game shop and buy the special edition cover of Radiant Citadel. Radiant Citadel is a set of 13 adventures that all kind of star off of this one location known as the Radiant Citadel. These are adventures that really break away from the standard European medieval focus of fantasy RPGs that we've had for like the last 50 years. They cover a wide range of different cultures and cultural influences. They were written by a very diverse set of writers and they're all really pretty, pretty interesting. So I have not done a thorough review of the entire book, but I definitely looked at a handful of the adventures in here and I think it's great. I think it's an outstanding book. And there's a couple of things that really grabbed my attention when I looked at it. So I've talked about the city of the Radiant Citadel before, but it's a really neat cosmopolitan city floating out there in the ethereal plane. Very fantastic. Like all of these events, this, this location and a lot of the adventures definitely have high fantasy going on. A very neat sort of idealistic community here. Interesting political things at play, but it's really like the author sat down and said, what would be the best representation of a city that we can imagine that would be a good fun place to work for and they they created it in the radiant citadel i believe this chapter was given away for free i don't know if it still is and lots of details about the city itself and then you have all of the adventures kind of spawn off from the city you could get to any one of the locations in any of these adventures by basically traveling outside of the radiant citadel and going to any one of the adventures this book is not a campaign adventure it is not a big you know, get from the first adventure to the, to the last adventure. It is definitely a series, uh, a, a, a series of individual adventures. So you could play them one to 14. I'm pretty sure you could just have the characters level after every one and return to the radiant Citadel. You could certainly run it that way. I, I don't think the expectation is that that is how you will run it. I think the expectation is that you can grab any of these adventures and you could run them at any given time. It'd be kind of interesting. And I bet you there are groups that use a sort of West Marches style where you go to the Citadel and you might drop three different seeds of three different adventures in front of the characters and let them pick which one. The adventures definitely are level based. So it's like a first level adventure, second, third, fourth, and so on. And it goes up to, I think... The last one, I think, is 14th level. Orchids of the Invisible is for 14th level characters. They, they cover the whole level range, but you could still, and they, they even say in the beginning, like, here's how you can tweak these adventures to meet different level ranges or different numbers of players by reducing monsters, by re- increasing or decreasing DCs, things like that. So you theoretically could, especially if you get to the characters to like second or third level, you could offer multiple adventure paths in front of the characters and they could pick which one they want to do. Sort of like running Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. I bet you you could do that with this pretty well and just make make tweaks to the number of monsters and the difficulty of those monsters and things like that. And I bet you it would work out. I bet you it would work out pretty well. One of the things that I really like about so first of all, Salted Legacy, which is their first adventure, is a really kind of fun adventure where you are dealing with a feud going on in like the night market, like a food court that's going on here. It is one of the few 
Wizards of the Coast published first level adventures that won't likely get you immediately killed, which is nice because I like the idea that new players that are coming to the game and play at first level might play an adventure where they aren't immediately killed. I think that that's healthy for the hobby. So I, I like I'm being I'm being a, a punk really fun adventure you know not not a very dangerous adventure but there's definitely a lot of risk it is mostly in dealing with you know crucial conversations between different groups which i really which i really kind of enjoy so i thought that's really good a really good introduction to the book and a really fun a really fun adventure that won't that won't completely wipe you out i've spot i've jumped in and spot looked at other adventures but one of the things i really love about this is that they have a very clear common format for every adventure that's in here it's clear that they spent a lot of work to make sure that they want these adventures to be as digestible and usable as they can more so than i would say a lot of other wizards of the coast adventures which is really interesting like the format for this each adventure is not particularly long like even though it's a 14 page or even though it's got 14 adventures in it the book is only 224 pages so it's not a huge 300 page book so it means the adventures are roughly like four or five pages or they're, they're relatively short and the shorter they are the easier they are to digest but they all meet a same common approach and one thing that's really crucial is because these adventures are based on a lot of different cultures in the world and, and you know me being a white dude from chicago having a pronunciation guide is really handy and every one of the adventures has a pronunciation guide for the main characters and the main locations in the story and that is really given the wide amount of different cultures that are there. I think it's fantastic to have a, I think it's fantastic to have a, a pronunciation guide. It was a really, really handy way for people to kind of get into the game. The adventures themselves. So they have that, that, that pronunciation guide. A lot of the adventures have like, when you meet NPCs, like they, they say like, you know, here are the things or strong voice shakes as she explains the significance. And then you have like four bullet points of main points that the NPC does. Other Wizards of the Coast adventures have started doing this more and more. More, and I think it's really useful. I've seen it in Wild Beyond the Witchlight as well. This idea of summarizing it, and it very much fits my ideals of secrets and clues. These, in fact, many times when I play an adventure like this and they have that kind of stuff, I can just go in and grab those bullets and drop it right in secrets and clues. Makes it really, really easy and straightforward to do it. A lot of NPCs, they continue to have like the personality traits to help you run a particular NPC. Beautiful artwork. And in fact, this is one where like d and Beyond is nice, but boy, a physical book, the artwork that's inside of a physical book is something else. Like I know this is with Wild Beyond the Witchlight too, that these big full page pieces of artwork in the book are just gorgeous. And I don't think you quite get the same I impact from them that you get with a physical book. All of the maps, I think aside, Mike Schley did the map for Radiant Citadel itself. Every other map inside is what I would refer to as a Dyson style map. Some people are like, I really want color maps. I can, I can see both points. But I am perfectly fine with black and white maps. I've used black and white maps. And I'll tell you, though, it's a different kind of situation when you look at, like, the maps that are done. So here's another example map. I think these are really good-looking maps. I think, I, think they look, I think they look cool. I'm, I'm, I'm good with them. They are not... Like, these are really nice maps. By the way, a point that I know that there's some cynics who will say, like, oh, the only reason the Wizards of the Coast is using black and white maps is because they don't want to pay as much. But I have talked to Chris Perkins, this was years ago, about this. And he said, no, they pay the same rate for color maps or black and white maps. They are not. They are not doing black and white maps to be cheap. They are using it because they, they like that particular style. I think that's probably still true. So... If you like black and white maps, you are fine. I, I, they grew on me. I remember when Wizards of the Coast switched over from having like Mike Schley and Jared Blando, very high color, very stylized maps to black and white maps. One of the things is they're easier to draw. You can also print them and you can do blueprint printing at like a Kinko's and it's a, or at, at FedEx and it's way cheaper. So a lot of people, you know, it's, it's personal preference. I think the important thing to tell you is they are black and white. You get to decide if that matters to you or not. I am totally fine with black and white. I don't, I don't have any problem at all. The adventures themselves, though, they, they definitely took, in many cases, or in, in the cases I looked at, because I haven't looked at every single adventure, these are still very clearly D&D &D adventures. They are not... The, the, the style and the plot and the drives and the motivations and sort of the arcs that the adventures take are definitely standard kind of D and D adventures, but the flavor that exists, them are all built around these, these different cultures that, that sort of influenced the adventures themselves. And so it kind of paints them in a whole different picture, which I really like a, because 
I think a lot of D&D comes from that. I think a lot of D&D is like, we have the same like basic 12 locations or 20-ish locations. We have the same kinds of quests that people go on. What really is different is the flavor that is going on here. And in here, the flavor is a widespread of different flavor from a whole bunch of different cultures that break away from what we've had for the last 50 years, which is mostly a European medieval-centric fantasy role-playing game. And if you dig European medieval fantasy role-playing games, that's fine. And most of the adventures support you. So, you know, I think it's really cool to have a book that's a whole bunch of different kinds of adventures. I think it's very possible that Radiant Citadel, it's, it's, you know, nice, beautiful cover art too. I think it's very possible that Radiant Citadel might be a a near perfect adventurers league style game because you know what the fixed level range is and your character can progress level to level as they're going through these adventures but each of the adventures stands on their own so strixhaven for example was a recent adventures league adventure and the problem is that the strixhaven adventures are tied so tightly together that if you miss one or two of them you're totally out of the loop for the next ones this one you don't have to worry if you jump in and you do just the eighth level adventure it's totally a perfect standalone adventure so i think that this is certainly I mean, to say it's one of the best sets of Wizards of the Coast published standalone adventures, that's not really fair because there's only like three. So one of the best means it could be anywhere in the list. Where would I rank it? I would say, I think that the design and the editing is probably easier to digest than Ghosts of Saltmarsh, which I think is one of my favorites. But Ghosts of Saltmarsh can also tie together into a bigger campaign, probably a little bit easier than this one did. I think there's more strife going on in the city of Saltmarsh than is going on necessarily here. One of the other things I forgot to mention is that each of the, not only does each of the adventures have the adventure itself, every one of them has a gazetteer about the main location of that adventure, which is this like miniature campaign setting. For each one. So if you find that you really liked one of the settings that you went to, you can grab this one and run with it and go off. And this is something that I really, really loved about Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, which had all of these different domains of dread. I've been using Van Richten's Guide. I've been squeezing every ounce out of that book for my Wild Beyond the Witchlight game by through the use of dreadful incursions. But I love having these like three or four paragraph or half page or even just one page description of a locate of a, of a campaign area because it really helps my mind run i generally don't need more than that again it's very digestible it's very easy for me to read it and run with it so saying like well here's a 384 page book about this particular location not always super useful to me but one page really useful to me and i might fall in love with one of these and decide i want to run a whole campaign there so everyone not only are you getting 14 14 13 13 adventures set in all of these locations but every one of them, you're getting 14 small setting guides as well. 14 gazetteers for each one as well. That also has maps and artwork and everything like that. That is a really, for, for a 224 page book, that is a lot they've managed to pack into this thing. And I'm very excited about it. So I think it is an outstanding book. I, if, if you are looking for a book of non-European focused independent adventures that you could run as one shots or that you could tie together into a small series of, of adventures. I think it's an outstanding book for that and I highly recommend it. So I am very pleased with Journey from the Radiant Citadel. I think it's an outstanding book. I, I like it very much. This past week, Wizards of the Coast put out the Wonders of the Multiverse playtest. It's an Unearthed Arcana and it's really interesting about when they put this out. I'm only going to talk about a couple of things with this. Because I, when, when they put out playtests, I don't dive into them as thoroughly as many do. There's lots of people who read over every line, every class thing. One thing is I'm generally, generally not grabbed by, I, you know, the, the things that happen with characters, I don't pay too much attention to. I'm focused on DM kind of stuff. So, and I, and it's not because I don't care. It's because I figure lots of other people are going to spend time focused on character stuff. The other thing is I'm a bit cynical because I've seen some of the results of what comes out of the playtests and they change in, they either change insignificantly or they change for the worse and then they come out and published. So I, I tend not to spend too much time digging into the character options that exist inside playtest. But there are a couple of things that, that jumped out. One, though, is thinking about when this is coming out and what it means for the future of d and I am of the belief that we that other than the handful of people who are currently involved in the next iteration of d and which is scheduled to come out a couple years from now, that other than the people who are directly working on it, none of us can really predict exactly what's going to happen with it. And I would bet that even the people who are working on it can't exactly predict what's going to happen with it because two years is a long time and a lot could happen. That gives them essentially a year and three months 
of actual development time before they have to start like actually publishing it. So we're going to see what that means. But what I find interesting is when they're putting out an unearthed arcana like this for clearly some other book, and they're talking about new character options, they're talking about new stuff, they're trying out, as I've heard them refer to, new tech. And, and an example of new tech would be like backgrounds that have a feet tied to them or feet trees. Those are clearly two new directions that Wizards of the Coast is doing. It does give us a little bit of a view of what they think the next iteration of Dini might be like. And what I like about this, I think last week I talked about the things that I really hope for the next version of D&D. And number one on my list was true backward compatibility with 5e. And I think that is likely something, I don't want to say likely. I think the probabilities are pretty good. And the reason why is I doubt that they would bother to put out a play test for, for something like this and, and then change the game so significantly that even this is obsolete. And my point is, as long as this works, right, as long as the character stuff that they're putting in this is going to work with the new iteration or sort of sit side by side well with the next iteration of D&D, I think that means the old stuff will too. Because the reality is, this can sit along the original 5th edition player's handbook just fine. A lot of things have changed with 5th edition over the past eight years. Big, big things for characters have changed in the past five years. But generally speaking, it's still compatible. You can still go buy Horde of the Dragon Queen and run it, whether you're using Tasha's or not. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. So I think I think seeing what they're doing with this, knowing that they're even putting out a play test like this for clearly some kind of planar product. Again, I would look at it and go, oh, look, Planescape. Who knows? I, I see Planescape everywhere, though. I'm, I'm happy to see this because it shows that they're still leaning in a particular direction. I have a feeling when we see the next iteration of D&D, if I had to predict it, and boy, we know that predictions are foolish, but we can't help ourselves sometimes. Human beings are so good at making predictions so good at it we're just terrible with accuracy and it's one of my favorite jokes and when we look at this my, my hope is that when we look at the next iteration of dnd i think it'd be really great if you picked a champion fighter from the from the original fifth edition player's handbook and you play it against whatever a new fighter is from the new dip version both could sit at the same table and play the same game and and both players would be happy that's really what i'm hoping for We'll see if we get there. But I think it is interesting that they're still making this stuff. And I, I have a feeling this is showing us the kinds of things we're going to see in the next iteration. Will we see feet trees? I don't know. Will we see feet tied to backgrounds? I don't know. But they're clearly trying it out. So I think that that's the kind of thing that they're experimenting with to see what what is going to lead up and sort of make its way into the original, into the into the next iteration of D&D. So that's interesting. But the other thing that grabbed me, this is like a specific thing, and it got it's going to get me on a bit of a rant. They have a new cleric subclass called the Fate Domain. And because I haven't been crazy about the two new subclasses for clerics that were in Tasha's, I thought, oh, let me take a look at what they're doing here. They have a new ability called Strands of Fate, which is a channel divinity feature. You can use your channel divinity to see and manipulate the strands of fate that weave around other individuals. As a bonus action, you can enter the state for up to one minute or until you lose concentration, as if you're concentrating on a spell. For the duration, whenever another creature you can see makes an attack roll or an ability check, you can use a reaction to give the roll advantage or disadvantage, your choice. So this felt a little silvery barbsy to me, and I'm, I think we, we know how I feel about silvery barbs, but there's a reason why I feel that way about silvery barbs, and I'm starting to articulate, and I'm starting to get the idea about why I get bothered by this kind of thing. And it's not because it's like powerful or you know game-breaking stuff. It's because of the way it interrupts the game. And the example is, most of the time when a DM is running the game and they say something like, the ogre slams its club into your head, the DM then rolls a die and says, it rolls an 18, which is going to hit you. It does 12 points of damage. That most of the time the DM can just do that. You can roll right in the narrative. The veteran makes three long sword or makes two long swords and a short sword attack. You roll a big handful of dice. One of the swords hits you for seven damage. The other two you miss and you parry. Right? You have this common flow. But if you do that, this breaks that, and it breaks it because you don't get to do this after you see the results of the roll. The way that you invoke advantage and disadvantage has to be done before you know the results of the roll. So if a DM says, the ogre swings its, its club at your head, rolls an 18, you can't then say, oh, I'm going to use Strands of Fate on that. Because it's too late. You already know it's an 18. In theory, you would have to say, I'm going to use Strands of Fate between when the, cleric, when the DM said he swings at you and rolls a die. But that process is usually so fast, you don't get it in there. So instead, what you do is you end up taking something that was one step, which is the DM says what the ogre is going to do, rolls the die, tells you the result, and then tells you how much damage you've done. That's one sort of one transaction. You can do all that in one sentence. The ogre swings its club with an 18 that hits you for seven points of damage. That's one line 
instant done. The problem is this ability would mean that, no, you have to space it out. And you would have to say, the ogre is going to swing a club at your head. Are you going to use strands of fate on it? Nah, I'll let this one go. Okay, he rolls an 18. Damn, I wish I'd used strands of fate. Okay, he does 12 damage. But now think about it. You're attacked by four veterans. Every veteran has three attacks that they make. That's 12 attacks. I could, I could do that really quickly. Or I'm going to say longsword number one. Are you going to strand of fate it? No, I'll let that one go. Okay, he rolls a 17 and hits you for 12. He's making a second longsword attack. Are you going to strand of fate it? No. Okay, he rolls. He rolls a 12 and he misses. He rolls a short sword attack. No, I'm not going to do a short sword. Okay. Next veteran attacks. Long sword. I'll go ahead and strands of fate that one. Okay. Then he does makes that one with disadvantage. It creates this interrupt. And I've seen this in Numenera. When I'm running my Numenera game, they have this thing called player intrusions. And I've had it where I'm in the middle of the narrative and a player say, oh, wait, I want to jump in and I want to intrude on that. I want to do this GM intrusion where I'm going to make that thing that just happened not true anymore. And it's kind of fun, but it does break this narrative flow. And that's kind of my problem with counterspell. Counterspell is the same way. So this isn't a new problem. This problem exists in the original fifth edition book. And that problem is when you have a player who's going to cast counterspell, they don't necessarily know what spell is being countered, which means instead of saying the wizard casts a fireball on you and does 20, 28 points of damage, make a DC 15 dexterity check. Instead of just doing that, you have to say the wizard begins to cast a spell. Are you going to counter it? I don't know. What kind of spells look like? I don't know. How do you know that? Oh, I want to figure it out. Well, it takes your reaction. According to Xanathar's guide, it takes your reaction to figure out what kind of spell it is. And if you're using your reaction, you're not going to be a counter spell. Well, that's a lame roll. I know it's a lame roll, but that's what they said. Okay. Well, then can the other guy do it? And it becomes this like, essentially what you create is the magic, the gathering interrupt stack. It becomes this like action. What do they call it? The in magic, they have a name for it. It's like the number, the stacks of actions that occur and how they, how they come into play. And, and I don't like it. I don't like that. I like smooth. What would I do with this power to make it better? What I would do is you use, I'd probably make it an action instead of a bonus action to fire it up. But let's say it's a bonus action. You use a bonus action to fire it up. And as part of invoking it, as part of the original power, you can pick a target and that target gets disadvantage against its next attack roll. And on each of your turns, as a bonus action, you can make, you can choose a target and give that target disadvantage on its first attack roll. But it takes your bonus action each turn to do it. And now it's not an interrupt, right? Now you you have to do it on your turn. It takes your bonus action to do it, which means you can't swing with your sword, but that's okay. And there's not an interrupt because you know it's going to happen. So let's say, though, we don't have control. I don't know that Wizards is going to put this in or not. I'm going to give them my results, but I've given res I've given feedback on lots of things and they, you know that, that don't get changed. One of the things that we can do is DM. So what can we do? I'm not concerned about what Wizards does with their design. I'm concerned about how we take it and what we do with it. And I have a couple of thoughts. One is, of course, you could house rule all this stuff. And you could say like, okay, anything that's a reaction like this, we're going to turn it into an action that you invoke ahead of time. Sort of like a readied action. The other thing we could do, though, is we can essentially create a phase of the game, a new phase, when the monsters are about to go. Right after the characters have gone, and right before the monsters go, we stop and we say, does anybody have any intentions of things that they want to react to for these monsters? For example, you know that there's a wizard. Is anybody planning to counterspell the wizard? Yes, I'm probably going to counterspell the wizard. Okay. Is anybody going to try to use, you know, I know that you picked the new fate-based cleric domain. Are you going to use strands of fate on any of these monsters? Yeah, probably the biggest attack I see. Okay, that's definitely going to be this guy. And you essentially lay them, lie them all up ahead of time, sort of like in the old version of D&D where everybody committed to their actions before it happened. We can do something like that now, only we do it and we essentially have the reaction line. And the reaction line, the, re, the reaction phase is where you declare your reactions first. And, and this is definitely like something where the DM has to say, I'm not going to screw you. I'm not going to, oh, because I know that you're going to counter the mage. I'm not going to say that the mage is only using a cantrip. Like, that's a dick move. Or I'm, I'm going to have them avoid it. The monsters don't know what the character is going to do. The DM does. Really important that the DM is working with the players so that when the player says, I want to use strands of fate on the biggest attack I see, you go, oh, that's that fire giant. And he's going to slam with a hammer. And you're like, yeah, that. Tell them what the big one is so that they know which one they're going to do. And, and, or, or have the mage blow of spell. How much better is the narrative? When you have the wizard casts, picks up and draws this ball of fire. And as he hurls it, your reaction kicks off and you cast counterspell and the ball just turns into a ball of ice and it thumps on the ground and rolls away. And everybody in the battle stops and watches it roll into the river and goes sploosh. 
the narrative isn't broken. I'm better with that. So I like this idea of essentially creating a reaction phase right before the monsters go, where the players can declare their intentions to use reactions when you need to, when you know that they do it. If it's something that you see, the minute in your game where you say to yourself, hey, this might be a time where it's time for this reaction phase, you can drop that in. In that case, that works with Strands of Fate because you're telling them, you're, you're getting their expectation from them. You're understanding that their plan is to use Strands of Fate and you want them to use it in the most optimal situation, which is probably against the biggest single attack that somebody is doing. I think that's pretty good. Silvery Barbs, you could still do the same thing. Silvery Barbs is a... The trick of Silvery Barbs is like, well, I don't know all of the things that are going to occur. So you might say, well, what kinds of things would you want to use Silvery Barbs on? Well, I probably want to use Silvery Barbs when my friend casts Finger of Death. And if they make their save, I want to make them have this. Okay, well, you know, so you double up. I think we could do something like that. But generally speaking, again, I don't think anybody from Wizards of the Coast is listening. But if anybody was, right? And I'm probably going to put this in my feedback. I really don't like reactions. I don't, I want fewer reactions because they add this stack. They add, and every reaction adds another layer of the stack. And that just makes it, it's in constantly interrupting the flow of the game. And that, that, that it hurts, you know, it makes it harder for my, makes it harder for me as a DM. And I don't want the game to be harder for me to run as a DM. I want, like, I, I really think the DM is a cornerstone of running a D&D &D game. We should make it as easy as possible for DMs to run the game because without a DM, you can't play. So let's make things easy for the DM. Don't, cool, cool character abilities sell books. They don't run games. <laughs> so I think that we, uh, you know, that's, that's my rant on adding to the stack. But my solution to it, it's not just a rant, it's a solution. And my solution is as DMs, I'm going to try it. I haven't tried it yet. This is an experiment. But my thought is try this reaction layer, this reaction phase. Describe your intentions of your reactions so that we can let them smoothly go into the, into the phase. One of the other things that happened this week is the second chapter of the Spelljammer Academy Adventures was released. This is really interesting. Wizards of the Coast definitely has been capitalizing on its purchase of D&D Beyond. They've been putting out a lot of material there. They put out Vecna there. They put out these Spelljammer Academies. They put out the preview to Radiant Citadel. They're definitely putting a lot of new material on D&D Beyond. Again, if you like D&D Beyond and you're a customer of, of Wizards of the Coast, it's pretty great because you're getting a lot of free stuff. There's definitely arguments that are they just locking people in more, but that's really like a different conversation. And the answer is it's free anyway. So you, right now you can get access to the Spelljammer Academy adventures for free. The link for this is in the show notes below. You click on it, you add it to your account and you get it to your account. And they put out four, they're putting out four adventures, but two of them are now out. We talked about orientation before, which is your first foray into being a Spelljammer. The interesting thing about it is I think these four adventures, which are fully produced by Wizards of the Coast, they are free, full published adventures. They, they look as solid as anything you would find from any of their other published stuff that they lead you up to the box set for Spelljammer, which I think starts at fifth level. So in this case, they're getting you from, from first to fifth level with four free adventures that you can then go right into Spelljammer, which is really cool. I mean, it, I think that this is a really good introduction to the, to the box set, it seems like. And if I were running Spelljammer, I probably will run it at some point. I don't know. I don't think it's in my next two adventures, but I definitely would run it at some point. I would probably start with these and go with them. The other thing is they are part of Adventures League right off the uh, right out of the gate. So if you are playing in Adventures League, you can play these starter adventures uh, as part of Adventures League, leading into the Spelljammer box set that's coming out next month. I didn't really get a chance to look at Trial by Fire. It is written by a, a good friend of mine, Rich Leska Flair. Rich Leska Flair wrote Esper Genesis, which I've reviewed on this show before. Fantastic designer, fantastic layout guy, really really nice dude, and he wrote this for them, fully produced by Wizards of the Coast excellent adventure i am looking forward to checking it out i'm i'm looking forward and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to eventually running it when i start running some spell jammer stuff so that's really cool a neat neat free thing again is it is there any bad part of it not really i mean there there, there, are, there are arguments again about well, how come they don't release it on the dm's guild or it's only available on here but one thing i did is like you can save these to pdf and put them on your local machine i did it i i, I opened these up i saved them to pdf and i have local copy i think i didn't i didn't think i even bothered to save them because I'm like, I have them here. But there's definitely an argument of like, oh, you're getting this stuff and it might not be here forever. That's true. And if you care, you can save it as PDF. Storm Knight UK says a part three is dropped tomorrow. Cool. You said we drop. Who's we? Who's we, Storm Knight? But yeah, it's going to be showing up on, uh, that, that sounds good, that, that, that Adventure 3 is going to show up on D&D Beyond Rock. I don't know. It's a really hard, it's a really hard question. But in any case, who wants who you can't complain about the price and you can't complain about the quality either. The quality on it. Let's let's take a look. Well, first of all, cool artwork. Really, as good as a long, it's it's a lot of a lot of 
a lot of words, a lot of text. It looks fantastic. So I'm I'm eager and excited to 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 try this out. I bet that is art from the the box set that's coming out. I think this is the first one where you actually have like how to fly a ship. Look at that squid ships. Neat. Yeah, so cool stuff. So I'm excited. I'm definitely excited for it. That is the Spelljammer Academy trial by fire. My friend Teos Abadia, speaking of Spelljammer, my friend Teos Abadia has been hired to do a series of articles on Roll20 about Spelljammer and what Spelljammer is coming up. You can find links. I think he's got two articles out now. I linked the first one. This is in the show notes as well, where he talks about the stuff that's inside Spelljammer. So that is also very cool. So obviously there is a lot of lot of drive, lot of interest. I think Spelljammer is going to be a very successful, a very successful campaign that Wizards of the Coast puts out. But yeah, check out, I think it's on their blog. Let's see. The Spelljammer Dispatch, it's called. And written by I think he I thought he had a second one. I, I can't find it. I don't see it. But I think he's got a second one coming out as well. So very cool. Teos is a good friend of mine and he and I have worked together on other D&D stuff. Really great. I've talked about him a lot on this show. Check out that in the show notes below as well. Ben Riggs is a journalist and writer who lives in Wisconsin and according to his own description, found himself at the right place at the right time to get access to a lot of people and a lot of data about the early days of, of D&D at TSR back when TSR owned D&D. And he wrote about all of this in a book called Slaying the Dragon, A Secret History of Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons, which is available now. You can pick it up on Amazon, published by Macmillan Publishing, and people really dig it. And Ben was on an episode of Mastering Dungeons with my friend Sean Merwin, where he talked all about where he talked all about how the book came to be, how he got the information for it, lots of really interesting things that are going on. And what I found particularly interesting about his talk, I, you know, I'm I'm always kind of a little interested in the history. Like I'll read it. It's not a big drive for me, again, because is it helping DMs today? Not not particularly. But it is interesting to know about where DD was back 40 years ago compared to where D, &D is now and and what it means today and i think the number one conclusion i get when i look at the data that he's putting out about what sales were like back then and the trends of sales back then which we're going to look a little bit out and from the conversations is that you really can't compare the two it's totally different obviously the world has changed radically in the last 40 years again D, &D beyond and roll 20 and these other things huge change the majority of players playing D&D today or playing online. What do you think it was like back 40 years ago? Well, there wasn't an online 40 years ago. Dramatically different, dramatically different stuff. So really, when I look at the sales data and stuff like this, when I look at the history of it, the, the one thing that comes out to me is it's nothing like it was in the past, which is important for doing like any, if you're trying to do any sort of like prediction of like, well, they did this back then, so they're going to do this now. I don't think you can really tie it together the interesting one are things like settings as part of the as part of kind of marketing for the book ben has been putting out sales data on twitter he's been showing some of the tables and charts of the from the data that wizard that he was able to get from former employees of tsr back when they were publishing back then and i thought they were pretty interesting to look at so here is for example sales data of settings and this is really interesting because it shows popularity and some of the things that are really interesting is like Raven, how, how far Ravenloft is compared to Dark Sun or Planescape. One thing that Ben said that he was really shocked by is not only did Planescape not sell particularly well, like in its 20, in the, in the 20 year period, it came out in 94, but in the five years Planescape came out, only 66,000 copies were sold. That's not a lot of copies when you think about it, especially when you look at like 87 version of Forgotten Realms, it shows 443,000 copies. And what they said is that they were actually losing money on every copy of Planescape they, they put out. Many people consider Planescape to be a fantastic campaign setting, a really big design. And they, it, it, you know, it, it not only didn't sell a lot, it's probably good that it didn't sell a lot because they were losing money on every version. There was a lot of this apparently in the later days of TSR where they were putting out products that were losing money on every sale. It's like that, it's like that old joke. We, we lose money on every sale, but we make up for it in volume. <laughs> One of the common, this also sort of fits that and, and it fits a common description that many people gave about what was going on in TSR back then, which is that as TSR published more settings, they cannibalize their own market. 
that they they had in order to keep up the same sales numbers, they would have to put out more products for the existing one, which a was a higher cost, but also ended up creating small fiefdoms of like, oh, well, we only play in what is it? Karamikos. I don't even know what that is. I never even heard it before. You know, I only play in red steel. You know, we only play red steel here at my game. And if you want to play your spell jammer stuff, you're going to have to play at another table. So they've, they've often described that, that how this fragmented the audience back in the late days of second edition, that they, they had so many books for so many different settings that the products were coming out were only, you weren't selling it to D and D audiences. You were selling it to only the people who bought this thing. Th where this matters today is I, I sometimes hear people say that they, they lament like when, you know, when is wizards going to put out more Eberron stuff? And the answer is probably, I don't want to say never, but it's probably not on the list. And the reason why is if they start putting out regular Eberron stuff, that no one who's going to play in their own home campaign, no one who's going to play in Forgotten Realms, no one is going to play, they're not going to generally play in that. That's something else interesting about Radiant Citadel is in each of the adventures for Radiant Citadel, it describes which how to incorporate it into multiple worlds. This is what it's like in Eberron. This is what it's like in the Forgotten Realms. They, they talk about how those adventures can be placed and everything because they want the products to be as universally useful as possible. So when they do something like Planescape or, or Spelljammer, right? We have Spelljammer coming up. We've had Eberron. We've had Ravenloft and Van Richten. Ravenloft and Van Richten designs might be the only time where two books came out that were in the same world. And that was Curse of Strahd, a campaign adventure, which was by far their most popular campaign adventure. And then... A Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, which you could argue are two Ravenloft books. And maybe they'll do something. Maybe there will be another Eberron book. But I bet you that other Eberron book is standalone as well, because both of those books are standalone. So it's really interesting. It's, it's really interesting to see like what, you know, what that's like. So he had some other some other trends that I thought were, were pretty interesting. That was settings. Basic versus AD&D settings were, were pretty interesting. Like which one sold which. And what I think is interesting here, and I guess like the timeline, if you if you look at it, they, like the steep drop off, 79 was when they released. Their their big peak year was 81. And then it died off by 84. And and we think of this as like the golden age of D&D. &D. But in four years, it died. Fifth edition has lasted way longer than that. Fifth edition's growth grew year over year over year for like five years. I think for all eight. I think it has continued to grow up. I think there's arguments, or depending on what data you're looking at, it's sort of plateaued at this point. It certainly hasn't dropped off. And it's nothing like this. It's way longer than this. So when they say things like 5th edition is by far the most successful version of D&D, &D, we often think, well, except for the TSR days. The argument is, I don't know, even in the TSR days, we know that the sales numbers of 5th edition are way higher than this. They're in millions of units. They're not in, thousands, in, in hundreds of thousands of units. There's probably an exponential. I don't know if it's exponential. Eh, there might be an order of magnitude jump and the number is sold. But the other thing is the trend line today, if you were to draw that trend line, I think I have it somewhere. It is not following this. It is still going up. So fifth edition is at its highest point ever, including the TSR days. If you, if you, you know, depending on how much you put in, into this data, monster manual sales data. I didn't even really look at this one yet. Same thing, same, same sort of trend. Like biggest year was sort of the 81. And then by 84, it was less than half the number of sales. Now it's possible Fifth edition is going to hit this age. The question is, with the new iteration, is it going to keep that plateau? What, what are we going to see like this? Except, you know, 81, 84 is only three years. And we know fifth edition is lasted longer than that. So it, again, all of this gets to reinforce just how big fifth edition is. And in my mind, really brings in that question of, boy, the pressure that's on Wizards of the Coast to not break that with the new edition. That has got to be really hard. I wonder if there's a lot of energy, a lot of strife, maybe even a lot of arguments going on inside of Wizards of the Coast about how to make sure that they don't break this. They, everybody's got new ideas. Everybody has ways that they want to take the show. They brought in a bunch of new developers and a bunch of new designers, and everybody's got big ideas about where they, where they want to take it. And yet they have by far the most popular version of D&D. How do you put out a new edition and not break that is going to be really hard. And the answer might be they, they're not able to. We'll see. Let's do some Patreon questions. Every month, every week on the DD Talk Show, I go through questions that were submitted to the monthly Patreon Sly Flourish DD QA. We go over the questions on, I, I answer every question on Patreon. Some of them I take here to the talk show, other ones I turn into other videos and things like that. How to Read says Do you have any thoughts, advice on running multiple games a week? I'm strongly considering starting a second campaign for a slightly different group and was wondering what your experience has been like, especially since you're currently running two different systems all together. Yes, I've been running multiple games a week now for years, like five years. And I love it. 
a couple of things. One, following the concepts of the lazy dungeon master can help you significantly when you're running as many games as that. If you're running, I think I'm running on, I, for a time I was running t about 10 games a month, which is a lot for me, but I've heard of other people running like one every day. And your prep prep time is going to be important because you can't spend four hours prepping every game if you got multiple games a week. So so certainly like the steps from you, you see me do it every week here on the show where I go through the steps to prepare for my game. I do the same thing, only it's usually a little faster for my Wednesday game. I've running running from multiple systems hasn't really been that hard either. You still have to know the system. And and it's it's a little harder in that I'm probably not giving the system enough time. It took me a while to sort of grasp everything that exists in Numenera to really run it. I sort of just ran and, and went with it. The same with Blades in the Dark. Like Blades in the Dark took me a lot of time to understand how to run it. And I only really gave it four sessions. So I, I don't know that I even gave it a fair shake because I'm running a lot of games and I just don't have the time to really dive in and really spend the time exploring it as much as one might with a whole new system. That said, it hasn't really gotten in the way. I've run multiple different campaigns for fifth edition. And that's been fine too. I've run and I've run I've run totally different campaigns for two different groups. And I don't think that I found that to be any harder than running the same campaign for two different groups, which I've also done a lot of. I've run like Curse of Strahd side by side and Ghost of Saltmarsh side by side, Homebrew Eberron campaign side by side. You can you can sort of reconstitute a lot of the material that you're using from one group to the other. But you also still need to go through it because the characters are different and the things that they're doing are different and the plots and the drives of the campaigns are different. My two Rime of the Frostmaiden games were very different from one another. My two Eberron games were drastically different from one another. So I don't think I found it much easier to run the same adventure for two different groups as, I, as you would think compared to running two different adventures. I don't think I found it that much harder to run two games with two different systems in two different campaign worlds. Like my Numenera, I'm not struggling running my Numenera game and my Wild Beyond the Witchlight game. I don't, I, it's, it hasn't been harder than running Rime of the Frostmaiden for two groups simultaneously right before that. So that, that's, that, those, are, those are my big experiences. One, you definitely want to have a way that you can do your prep quickly and easily. I recommend the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, as you would expect. The, but two, I didn't find it easier or harder to either have the same campaign or different campaigns or even different systems, as long as I knew them well. If I don't know a system particularly well, of course, learning a system is going to be hard. Rich says, how do you maximize meaningful player choices in your adventure design? Do you actively think about placing moments where players can make informed decisions that come with consequences? So I'm going to assume that you're talking about running a game and running a home campaign more so than publishing stuff, because I think that that's more relevant to, to all of us here that are running lots of games. And the answer is, I think that, yes, I definitely do. I definitely like to put in choices. I don't want to I don't want to do too much of the damned if you do, damned if you don't choices, but I definitely want to have meaningful choices. Whenever I'm kind of running a campaign, I try to ask myself, like, what are different ways that the characters can approach this? Are there at least two that I can think of? And then maybe there'll be more when they come up with their own. When I talk about situational based D&D &D design, I think about, you know, if are there two different ways to get into a location? Are there, are there different approaches that they can take to try to get in or to try to convince something? As long as I have like, you can talk to them and try to convince them that way, or you can fight them or you can sneak past them. Those are those are like common ones. Like those three, that's like a little easy one. Can you can you talk your way through it, sneak your way past it or fight your way through it? And if you can do all those things, which are like the three big things in D&D &D kind of exploration, role play and combat, that is a lot of options. But yeah, definitely you don't want to do like the oh, you can go left or right. Like I brought up that I brought up that idea of do you want to go down the well-trod, you know, do you want to go down the path that, that the, the very common, the long road, the very, very well-traveled road? Or do you want to take that sneaky path through the woods? Well, there may be a reason. There, there, oh, and by the way, that sneaky path, there, you, you know that there are some ruins that people haven't found before that claim there are riches there. So now there's a reason why you might, oh, yeah, the main road is safer and we're a lot less likely to fight the quantum ogre. But that path, we might find that, 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 that those old cairns that are filled with treasure. And that might be kind of fun to, to, pil to pilfer. So yeah, I try to, I try to, I definitely try to offer choices. And I think it's useful. The question is, I think we could put ourselves in the seat of the player and say, what information would we want to be able to choose whether we're going left or right? Which one's safer? Which one's more likely to have habited you know, or, or have civilized, civilized people compared to monsters? That one, one group has, you know, intelligent bad guys. The other one has monsters that they leave alone. 
just what are the options that are meaningful enough? So yeah, let's go to the monster path. So that way they don't know we're coming, but we're still going to have to fight monsters. So I think, I think definitely you want to, you want to think about it. And you know, a lot of time it can be two choices, but the other one is like, can you sneak fight or talk your way past something is another sort of good rule of thumb, you know, looking at it. And then if you have a dungeon, what are multiple entrances you can take? Matt N says, I have this problem where I'm constantly searching for the perfect TTPR, TTRPG game system, which I know doesn't exist. Anytime a new one comes out that presents some new and interesting mechanics, I dive in and want to learn everything. Easy. D6 is my latest obsession. Thankfully, my players humor me when I switch up from things from 5e, but I just have a hard time committing to one. How do you stay focused on 5e and the other core staples like you play like Numenera and not be swayed by the latest hotness? I think 5e is actually a great system and there are really no reasons to look outside of it, but alas, the explorer in me is always digging. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have that problem. I don't I don't tend to leap on the new the new hotness so much. I I, I kind of like the system that I like. I do like new stuff and I do like checking out new stuff. I buy everything and I read lots of RPGs. I just don't run them all. I have groups that are willing to, but a lot of times me needing to read an RPG and me needing to run it are not always the same. I don't, I don't, I don't have that drive. The question I would ask is, is it a problem? Is it your, are your, you said your players are good with it. If your players are good with it and you like switching systems every couple of weeks, sounds fine to me. I don't think you're missing out. I think it's definitely worth looking at other systems. I, I take a lot of the stuff that I've learned from other systems and bring it into my D&D games. So I think that that is totally fine. I think reading them is great. I think if you want to be a better DM, certainly understanding how other games work. Like, like Dungeon World shattered my mind. Dungeon World completely changed how I play D&D games after playing 4th edition for so long. So there's definitely role-playing games that can that can that can really push you out of one area and can really give you ideas about different ways to think about things blades in the dark made me think about heists differently and how to run dynamic skill challenges differently numenera taught me all about like just keeping a single number in your head and trying to use that number to sort of develop to develop monsters as much as you can the simplifying monsters 13th age taught me about how to run abstract combat fate taught me about zones there's all kinds of things that i've picked up from other rpgs that i have run once or twice so i don't you know it's a problem only if you're find it's a problem or your players find it's a problem and i but i don't think that you need to say i don't think you need to tell yourself like 5e is good enough and i never need to look at another rpg i, I think you should look at all rpgs if you like them I just like reading them. I think if you were dragging your players through every new system, it's worth considering that not everybody is interested in learning a new system like you are. I know I'm not. I don't really want to play in new systems. When If I have DMs that are like, hey, we'd really like to try this other new system, I'm like, eh, it, it better really sing to me. It better, the, 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 you know, the back of the box better really give me a good idea about what we're doing. Cause I just, I don't need new rule systems all the time. So I, so that's, that's my thought. But generally, if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. Matt, I hope that helps. AM says, would you ever reconsider doing another actual play? I get this question a lot, which is what I put in the notes. AM says, would you ever reconsider doing another actual play? I'm always learning from you, but I think I learned the most when you worked with newbie DM. You mentioned your regular players just aren't interested. And believe me, I get it. Maybe they could be convinced if it was for a good cause. It's not even that my players are or aren't interested. I'm I'm not really interested in it. I, I loved the game that I did with Enrique. And I and we're, we're talking about trying to do another one. I, I love the one-on-one -on -one play. There's a bunch of reasons why I don't do live play games. And one is I just, I'm too busy with everything else. And that isn't really where I think I offer the best value to this community. I don't think, first of all, it is a ton of work putting a live play together. A good one takes tons of work. It's not just a matter of getting people to go on camera and recording it on Skype. Like you really need to do editing you really need to do production work you got to make sure audio sounds good there's all these things i mean i'm not talking about like making critical role level stuff but to for me to do it the way i want to do it like i look back at the enrico and i'm people i'm glad people are happy with them but i could do way better now but I'm, it's going to take work i remember when when enrique and i when when enrique and i did them those are edited and i think they're way better edited because there's a lot of like us moping around and us reading rule books and us doing dumb stuff and that just doesn't make an interesting game in my opinion so i i definitely did editing on it and it took me twice as long as the episode to do the editing so it was essentially we would do it friday mornings is when we did that show and it took me all day friday to get the video ready and i'm not ready to sacrifice a whole day a week to do that so the big one is time and energy the other one is there are so many other live play videos out there and 
you know, we can learn from all of them. So I don't think you're going to get anything unique from mine that you can't get watching other people live play D&D. My, my games are not that different than anybody else's. And we can learn from so many others. And there's so many other people that are putting the time and energy into live play games that I just don't think it's an area where I offer something that is worth the amount of effort. Because it's like, do you want me to do that or do you want me to write another book? Neil Stevenson one time said this. He's like, I can either answer all your emails or I can write another book. Which do you want? And that's kind of the reality. It's like, if I did that, I wouldn't be expanding City of Arches. I wouldn't be working on my next project. There's a lot of other things that I wouldn't be able to do if I was going to do a regular live play game. And I, I just, yeah, it's DM Chrome. He says, next Kickstarter, live play stretch goal. No, because guess what? The money's not the problem. Saying like, oh, I got $10,000 more on my Kickstarter. Now I can do a live play. Guess what that didn't give me? Another day a week. <laughs> like it doesn't add time. So yeah, the answer is, it's just, I, I think that there's enough people doing it. And also it's my own interest. I'm kind of not interested. I'm kind of like when I play my games with my friends, I like to sit and I like to play games with my friends the same way we're all playing games with our friends because that's what most people are doing. So if you think about the per what's the ratio of games that are live compared to the games that aren't, it's so many, so much bigger with people that aren't, which means I'm learning way more about how to do this and offering the suggestions that are useful for the people who don't stream their games because there's so many more of them. So that's, that's my thought, you know, and I'm like, oh, people would like it. And that's very nice of you, but it ain't about me. It's about the game and it's about what we're all learning together and it's about what we can all share. And that's where I think I offer a greater value is learning about this hobby, learning about what it's like to run real games, learning about what other people are doing and articulating that and trying to put that together into useful advice that other DMs can use to run their game. That is what I think I really offer value. I don't think I would offer value in a live play game. That said, again, I really want to do another one with Enrique and, and I think we could do more. I would definitely do that. And I think we could do more with like me doing prep before the game so we could, and then maybe doing a little after show. I don't know if we could do that, but something where you could, how did the prep actually come out and play? And you could see it all. That'd be great. But it's also going to be different because it's one-on-one. -on -one. It is live. It would be live play. So it'd be different than a normal game anyway. So I'm, I put the question on here. I get it a lot. And now I've got, and now I can point people and say, here's why, here's why I don't. For those of you who really want me to do one, I am sorry to disappoint you. But I think the reason why you like what I do is because of what I'm doing now. And that's the kind of stuff that I want to continue to do. So thank you very much for that question. Mark B says, I played AL for the first time and the DM made no effort at all to include a quieter player. As a result, two of the five players said almost nothing for nearly four hours. One player immediately responded to, to every time the DM spoke and left no room for anyone else. As a DM, I could easily deal with this, but as a humble player, I struggled. I tried to engage with the quieter players, but I felt I could have done more to include the players, but also to signal to the DM that the players are being ignored. Suggestions. So first of all, you did a great job of even noticing that this is going on. Most people would not. Most people are thinking about their character sheet or the thing about their time in the spotlight they're not really thinking about the other players so the fact that you were seeing that there were two people that were quiet and that there's one player that was was you know dominating a lot of the screen time that already is a, a very valuable thing that you did you know i and i don't think you did anything wrong and could you have done more i mean i, I don't want to argue with it because you, you you tried you did stuff so i i think what you already you've done wonderful things what what can be done in a situation like this you could reach out to a dm and say hey i just noticed that these other two players first of all the big question are you online or are you in person because body language is very different you, you don't have any when you're looking online and a lot of times stuff like this can happen online it happens in my games online you can't there's a couple things that you do one is you can you your character can reach out to another character and try to like you know build a build a relationship with that other character so that you can call on them and they can kind of answer back and role play it could be that the players didn't mind some players are just happy to sort of be there they don't need to be involved in all the things and they're kind of happy so you you shouldn't make the assumption that the other players aren't having a good time even though they're quiet because that might not be true you might you know you could carefully reach out and ask hey how are you having a good time with this you know, and, and you could just say like, sometimes it's hard for me to know what other people are, how other people are enjoying it. And I just want to make sure you're enjoying it. You could reach out to the DM and say the same thing. Hey, I, I noticed that the other two, especially after the game or something like that, you said it's AL. So it's one session, then you're coming with a different group maybe, but you could say like, just, you know, you could say just to let them know, but, but boy, like it's hard for DM too. Like I, you know, especially online it's, it's DMs are doing so much stuff. It, it, it's that the, the dog who didn't bark problem. It, it's really easy to not remember that there are other people there if they're not saying anything. So I know I've been a problem. I probably do this all the time. I probably ignore people all the time. And 
you know, I try not to, but I'm doing so much stuff. And if they're not actively coming forward, it's harder for me. Now, they're coming to every game though. Like if they, if they disappeared, that might be a different problem. But I think some people are just, they're okay. They're okay being quiet. So what can you do? Well, you can talk to the players and say, hey, you know, especially if it's people you're playing with regularly. If it's in a one-shot game, there's really not much you can do because by the time you can do anything, the game's over. If you're in an intermission, if you could, if you could call for a break, you could mention the DM, hey, I noticed they didn't say anything or reach out to the player. Hey, are you, you know, well, no, I'm kind of bored. I, I'm, you know, so-and-so seems to be taking most of the time. Well, then you might say to the DM, hey, I just noticed, you know, so-and-so might, it might be good if you called on the other players. You might be able to do something like that in a break. But also don't forget the fact that uh, ALDMs are busy people and they got a lot going on too. And if players aren't really willing to kind of step up and say, Hey, you know, I'd like to speak a little bit more or something like that. I don't even know. It's not really on them either. It's a hard situation. And I don't know that there's a perfect, a perfect answer for that. So, so Mark, I hope that conversation at least helped. That is it for the Lazy D&D Talk Show today. I want to thank all of my friends on Twitch for hanging out with me today while we've been chatting. I want to thank the patrons of Sly Flourish for all of the support that you give for, for, for shows like this. If you enjoyed this show, you can help me out by subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter where you will get weekly articles sent directly to your inbox. You can support me directly on Patreon where you get access to all kinds of exclusive content, all kinds of special perks, but most of all, help me put on shows like this. You can, of course, always pick up my books in the Sly Flourish bookstore. All the links for those are in the show notes below and you can subscribe to my videos on youtube you can like my video and you can pass it along to a friend if you're enjoying what you see thank you all so much for hanging out with me today have a great day and get out there and play some DD.